This is uh, Richard Hall here, and uh, we're looking at the night sky at the moment. Um, there we are. And I've also got uh, uh, Kay with me. Uh, say hello, Kay. <laughs> Morning, uh, everybody. Uh, and uh, we, as I said, we're going to be looking at the night sky. And um, we're just in a changeover period now. It's looking at the, the night sky. Is we just the last of the spring stars and rising up of the summer stars at the moment. OK, but before we get on to that, I should talk to you about some of the special events that we've got coming up at Stonehenge um, on Friday, December the 22nd, which is actually the time of the summer solstice. Uh, we've got a very special presentation uh, called the Star of Bethlehem, which is probably the most famous star <laughs> of all. But just what was the Star of Bethlehem? Was it a real event? If it was, what, was, what was it all about and what actually happened? Well, it might be some few things that are going to surprise you, actually. Uh, so um, if you come along, uh, we start, the time is 7.30pm start time. You do need to book in, don't you, Kay? Yes, you do. Yeah, you can either book in directly from going from our website into the Zola booking system, or you can go to Event Finder and book in that way. Yeah. Whichever way you're most comfortable with. So we're going to take you through the greatest of legend and go from all different transcripts and information from around the world recorded by different people to work out exactly what that star was and so on. I okay. was watching a program yesterday which was actually talking about the crucifixion and the scientific evidence. But one of the interesting comments from one of the... Um, Archaeologists there is there very rarely is there smoke without fire and there most certainly was yeah. a person called Jesus who was active. Yeah, and crucified, yeah. Yeah. One can argue yeah, yeah. different other bits and pieces but I most think certainly find that there with, was. With most legends, isn't there? If you go back yeah, in time of you look truth. At, yeah, yeah, Ulysses and all these different characters, you find that they were real characters. You yes, know? we're not in the process of debunking people's beliefs out there. No. We are in the process of trying to help people see around and through and into some of the things. That yeah, yeah. And, like, mm. and I know myself in studying all this, I find it a very fascinating subject. So that's the Star of Bethlehem coming up on Friday, December the 22nd, just, just at the right time before Christmas and on the day of the summer solstice. And we'll be telling you about the solstice as well, okay? Yes. Right, so that's what we've got coming up then. Okay. Let's have a look at the night sky. Well, we're going to start by just taking a step backwards and looking at the night sky we looked at earlier uh, in November. And um, these are the stars that you'll see, I guess, just after sun, once this, it begins to get dark, you see the stars begin to come out. And uh, looking north, due north, the first thing you notice, of course, is the, the great square, those four stars. And you'll still be able to pick these uh, once it begins to get dark, but by the time it's truly dark, the square's going to be moving over towards the west. And uh, just below the great square you came down was M31, uh, which just appears like a hazy patch of light in the sky. You do need a dark sky to see this. But this, of course, was the most distant object you can see with the unaided eye. This, of course, is the great galaxy in Andromeda. And its distance is over two and a half million light years. So put that in perspective. We're seeing it as it was two and a half million years ago. And of course, the thing I always love about this is this galaxy is actually um, part of what we call the local group of galaxies, of which our, our galaxy is part. Uh, because, but if there was somebody out on a planet around those millions of stars, uh, as it says, that it contains one trillion stars, and that they were looking down here at Earth, of course, they'd be seeing the Earth as it was uh, two and a half million years ago. So they'd see these ape-like creatures walking around. They certainly wouldn't see... <laughs> yeah. Who seem to have been more advanced than people gave them credit for for yeah. a long time. That's yes. right, yeah. So that's the great galaxy in Andromeda. Andro I always say Andromeda, Andromeda, isn't it? Andromeda, Is yes. It's actually supposed to be addressed. So that's there in the early evening. And then just to the right of the great square, of course, we have uh, Jupiter. 
um, which is the largest planet in the solar system. And um, of course, whenever we talk about planets, we always imagine things a little bit like the Earth. But um, if, there's actually different types of planets in the sense that not just that they're different in their environment, but they're actually their composition. And in many ways, Jupiter is more like the Sun than it is the Earth. Um, I'll just pull up, there's the Earth alongside it to scale. Uh, for those of you watching this on TV, you can see it's a pretty awesome object, is Jupiter. And, um, but you know, there's no solid surface on Jupiter, right? It's, it's gas and dust, and you're looking down through the clouds, the white clouds are deeper uh, and the brown clouds are higher, and it's spinning so rapidly on its axis that it's the whole of the planet has become an oblate shape. But if you were to travel down through uh, Jupiter's clouds below, eventually you will come to an ocean down there. But not an ocean of water, but a an ocean of ammonia and methane and so on, under enormous pressures and so on. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a weird and wonderful world. And it also sends out, it's, it's got um, a very powerful magnetic field and sends out radio bursts and so on. Yeah. So it's Jupiter we can see in the sky at the moment. Right. And looking to the, towards the east in, in November, we saw the first of the summer stars. Right? So the night sky I'm showing you at the moment is our spring stars, so looking north. But rising up in the, in, the, uh, east. in the east, we've got the first of the summer stars, and those two are Matariki and Aldebaran. Right. A Deborah is probably the easier of the two to pick out, first of all, because it's so bright. It's a red giant star. And it's part of a cluster, it lays in front of a cluster of stars called the Hyades. The other one, of course, is Matariki. Right? Now, as we swing forward into the December evening, the Great Square sinks below the horizon. And looking late at night, we've got the full pageant of the um, summer stars in front of us. Jupiter's still there. And Matariki is almost absolutely due north there, right? And Matariki itself is goes by naming many names. It's actually a star cluster. It's actually a cluster of about a thousand stars, of which about seven can be seen with the unaided eye. That's why it's called the seven there sisters. There are records of people seeing more than that. Oh yeah, I can normally. Depends on that. how good your eyesight is, how how well. Not just your eyesight, but how well you can define the difference between the, the dark and the light there. Yeah. You will see more yeah. smaller stars. And as you get older, of course, they'll diminish a bit to the seven. Yeah. <laughs> so for those of you who says that, it says that it's 444 light years away. And it's the, it's normal term is, because we know it down here as Matariki, but because uh, it's, it's scientific name, it's the Pleiades star cluster. And the thing with a cluster of stars, they are all physically associated, right? And they and not only are they physically associated, they're bound together by gravity, and they were all formed together at the same time. Right? Yeah, their birth happened yeah. at the same time, didn't That's it? Right. Basically. So, and what you've got here is a really good example. You see, we, we talk about the seven sisters. Stars of different masses have different luminosities, and the more massive a star is, the brighter it is, okay? So when we look at the seven sisters, the hot blue stars there, we're looking at the giant stars in the cluster. But there's there's hundreds of stars which can be seen, which might be about the same brightness as our sun, all right? And in top of that, there's hundreds and hundreds of red dwarf stars, not one which can be seen with the unaided eye. The red dwarfs, of course, are the most common stars in the galaxy. If you look very carefully at, you know, if you can see this on your television, you can see some stars that have a tint of a different colour, not that blue, white yeah. look. Yeah. Among, mm. When new stars are formed, the, the, the varieties are always hot and blue. The more massive they are, the hotter they are, and so they tend to be... They radiate a lot of energy in the in the blue spectrum, mm, just and like things mm. heated here, like an acetylene yeah. torch compared to a candle flame. Right, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
And of course, the, the Seven Sisters of Matariki were important around the world because uh, they rose at the spring equinox thousands of years ago. And they marked the, pe the beginning of the year for all the peoples of Europe and Asia. And that's a tradition that was then carried into the Pacific. Yeah, there are slight changes in the way the, the uh, name is pronounced mm. as it travels, as the as it travels down through yeah the pacific that's right yeah yeah, yeah. and th th they are actually very very important stars to me because one of them called pleione was what really got me involved in in practical astronomy uh, research astronomy i studied it's a variable star but we we'll, we'll talk more of this at a later stage when mm. uh, um, it's a little bit more visible in the sky yeah if you look at the Maori names for them, then they're telling you all about the seasons and the important things, you know, the important aspects of that. Yes. You know, the names are indicative of that. Yeah. yeah. And what happens is whenever you see a star cluster, what we call an open star cluster, it's got a raggedy shape. All stars are formed in clusters, but with the passage of time, as Matariki travels around the galaxy, it, was, it will slowly disintegrate and the individual stars will then begin to travel on their own. Whenever you see star clusters, you know they're young stars, right? And our sun would have been part of a star cluster once upon a time. Somewhere out there are its brothers and sisters, and indeed, over recent times, astronomers have been trying to hunt down the brothers and sisters of the sun, and they've actually found one or two of them. Okay. Well, if they form out of the same nebula, they'd have very similar co chemical compositions. That's wouldn't exactly they? what they're looking for. Yeah. yeah. So you can you can kind of get them. It's yeah. a bit like having a um, I don't know one of those uh, uh, sale bands that they have. You know, when you buy goods and they've got all these little barcodes on them. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of an identifies them. So who knows what's out there, orbiting around those other stars and distance. Yep. And of course, the stars that we're actually interested, we're looking for life in the universe beyond the Earth. It's not the big bright stars we look at. The big bright stars don't live, live for long, right? Uh, they, they, they spend a lot, shoot out a lot of energy, but their lifetimes are short. They wouldn't have a very... Um, favourable environment around no, planets around violent, there. Yeah. There could be planets, well yeah. and truly, but oh, yeah. it wouldn't be a, a favourable environment. But what we need is stars got similar mass to, the, to our sun. There's billions of them out there, but it's a they're not very bright. And they I'm, are finding more now that they're getting better and better at distinguishing them from yeah. the, the from the light of the sun, their yeah. their sun itself. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, look, things like the star cluster of Matariki is uh, something we can learn a lot about the nature of different stars and so on by looking at Yeah, that. you learn a lot from the names. If you, look, if you look at the names and then look at what those names meant to whichever culture you're studying, Greek or, or Maori or whatever, then you learn a lot about what people were thinking at the time if you bother to look into it. Yeah, yeah. And that's the lovely thing about astronomy. It's got two aspects. From the beginning of time, our, our ancestors have used the stars to understand the cycle of the seasons, to navigate and so on. And the names of the constellations, the names of the stars, date back to that period, right? When our, what our ancestors were using a long, long time ago. So you've got that side of it, which is tied into our history, which is then linked to different cultures from around the world. But then you've got the, the science side of it, which is looking at what's out there in the universe, looking at the stars as suns and the worlds that may be orbiting around them and so on. And when you're looking at ancient cultures, don't discount their, their science because their observation was very good. Yes. Extremely yeah. good. And our, our modern stuff is actually based on their observations. Yeah, yep, absolutely. Okay. Right, so that's Matariki up there now. Um, but the, the most dominant constellation in our southern sk summer sky, so we should be down here, we can call it a sign of summer. Indeed, me, who comes from, originally came from England, it's the opposite way around the seasons. It's, was, Orion was the sign of winter. Now, Orion's quite a, a spectacular constellation. But I'm not going to talk about too much about that because we thought for our last program of the year, uh, 
what we're doing here we will spend it just on the constellation of orion because everyone knows how to pick orion out we're going to be talking about the marvels that's in and around that constellation of orion right? and for you people who are using the asterism the non-official name that's the pot, the pot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not very dignified name. no no that's right <laughs> okay so there's the, the wonderful orions up there now for, well, I thought we'd, we'd do it off by looking at some of the bright stars in that region. So we can still see Jupiter. Remember, Jupiter's a planet and it outshines all the other stars in the sky, right? Um, but it, and indeed, the word planet means wandering star. And yeah, because it moves against the background yeah, stars. Don't forget to our ancestors, it looks like a big bright star as it moves it around. It does. Yeah. But one of the differences is it's so much closer, it doesn't tend to. Um, to flicker does it yeah, as yeah. much as the stars do it's That's not right, as affected yeah. by atmospheric effects yeah, as the yeah. as the stars are yeah that's right yeah yes and so anyway if you if we go up orion's belt because those three belt stars the bottom of the pot is what Kay was calling it all right and if you go in a straight line upwards to the right traveling towards the east you will come to the brightest star in the sky right the only thing that outshines this are the planets. That's Takarua. <laughs> Takarua. Yeah. It's the star Sirius. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. As people, which means a searing one, right? Searingly hot, okay? And there, there's a photograph of it taken from Earth. Uh, its distance is 8.6 light years. Now that is a long, long way away, but it actually means on cosmic terms, it's, a, it's one of our neighbours, all right? Um, it's somewhat bigger and brighter than the sun. It's 25 times brighter than our sun. It's a white hot star. It's got twice the mass. So in other words, you've got two solar systems there. Its diameter is 1.7, but it is only 250 million years old. Right. That's the thing about these really big stars. They do not live very long. No. They use up their fuel mm. and then they start yeah. to head towards a supernova and of course the, i'm giving you that age because this has been discovered recently by the james webb telescope and so on so yes there could be worlds around uh, sirius but they're going to be in a rather formative stage well we've actually found worlds around supernovas so mm. worlds actually form rather easily yeah uh, absolutely yeah. yeah yeah i don't know what it is <laughs> Okay, so so this is this is super serious. All right, so let's have a look in close. Imagine we go. We 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 know that there's planets in that region, and there could be worlds. But as I mentioned, these worlds would be in a primordial state. It'd be like going back to the Earth uh, in its very early stages when the surface of the of our planet was mostly molten rock and so on. All right, so that's what we we mm. find around Sirius. But, of course, the amazing thing about Sirius, as they discovered, it's not a single star like our sun, but it's a binary star. It's got a companion. But this companion star is so faint and so close to the bright star, it can't be seen with anything less than a very large telescope or special equipment. And we call this, this other star the pup. And the reason for that is that Sirius is obviously on normally known as the dog star right and the reason for that is in it's in the bright it's the brightest star in the constellation of canis major the great dog right so everyone calls sirius the dog star so the fainter ones called it is its pup okay but this pup was an amazing object and it sort of changes our knowledge about the stars so let's go and have a look at the pup in a bit closer detail right doesn't wonder it doesn't want to does it no oh, we've just brought it up now well this this pup is white hot but it's very very faint right well if you've got something that's really hot faint that tells you its surface area is very small indeed the pup is only about the size of the earth you seem to have a maori conch coming in irregularly. Yeah. <laughs> that's right yeah yeah it's, it's about this it's about the size of the earth but it's got the mass is greater than that of the sun so 
what you've got is all the matter like of our solar system squeezed into an object, right? The size of the Earth. And it's no, what we call these, uh, this object is a white dwarf. And what it is, is the relic of a dead, it's, a, it's actually the corpse of a star. It's only shining by its... So this star would have been bigger than Sirius yeah. and therefore not lived as long. That's right, yeah. Mm. And that what we've got left is just a core, which is now slowly cooling. And eventually it's going to go cold and dark. But don't, don't imagine landing on it, because if you've got the mass of a, <laughs> something the size of the sun squashed into the volume of the Earth, um, well, if you landed on the surface, that you'd, you'd find yourself weighing something in the region, I don't know, 10,000 tonnes is how much you would weigh. And um, yes, you'd quickly be squashed on the surface, flattened over the area the size of a football field, OK? Hmm. So not a good idea. No, no. But you would end up with, you've got carbon there, haven't you? Isn't it true you could end up with diamond? Absolutely. Fix? It's turning Just in, diamonds it, you can't mine. It's turning into a diamond the size of the earth. That's yeah. just it. <laughs> it's white hot at the moment, but you are, it is turning into a gigantic diamond. You can yeah. only look at this diamond in the sky. I'll never be able to go and get it. No, that's right. <laughs> So that's the white dwarf, okay? Now, as, as Kay just mentioned, uh, because it's a binary system and, and essentially the pup is a corpse, it means that the originally it must have been bigger and brighter than its companion and because of its greater mass has evolved rapidly. So if you could step back a few millions of years, okay, you know, uh, you, you'd find that, yes, there was a big, brilliant red star in the sky. So it would have started off as a hot blue star, bigger and brighter than Sirius. So it would have been an awesomely bright star in the sky. Then that star, as it's aged, has expanded into a red giant. So this star would have then gone red and increased in brightness. And then it would have blasted all its outer layers away until all you've got left is the white dwarf. Right? Now, we, we can't see all these things, of course, but the lovely thing is that when we peer out into space, we can go from different places and we can see all these different stages that are occurring. Yeah, and that stuff that is blasted off will probably eventually become the raw material for another star. Absolutely, yes. And that's how you can tell the difference between the two stars because the chemical composition has changed. That's right, yeah. yeah. And it's, that's important as well because what these, these stars are doing is creating elements. So as the universe gets older, the, the heavy elements, gold and all that sort of thing, become more common. Yeah, gold's yeah. in a supernova, created yeah. in a supernova, isn't it? That's right, yeah. yeah. That's why it's rare, because mm. supernova are rare, yeah. Mm. So everything we have on the Earth has got this link to something out there. Okay, okay. so now we've just turned round to the south now, all right, and we've got the Southern Cross laying on its side. This is just after midnight, in, right, um, looking out there. And looking to the south, we've got the second brightest star in the sky, and that star is Canopus up there, all right. Again, dead easy to pick, it's so bright. You know what I find fascinating about this one? Canopus was a really important navigational star, especially for Māori who were coming to New Zealand because when it was close to the horizon, it marked the Hawke's Bay region, you know, where the Takitimu canoe came in. But also, if you go out in a spaceship, you have to lock on to three objects in order to be able to navigate, and one of them's Canopus. Canopus yeah. So it's still keeping its navigational importance right up to our time as well. The only difference is, of course, in astronomy, a lot of astronomy has been written in the Northern Hemisphere, and you can't see Canopus from the Northern Hemisphere. I know, but the important people can see it. Of course they can. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, let's have a look at Canopus then. OK, it's the second brightest star in the sky, right? The, but it, the thing is, it's 313 light years away. Now, remember, Sirius was just over eight light years away. So this tells you that Canopus must... To be the second brightest star in the sky at 313 light years, it must be a pretty luminous star. And indeed it is. It's 13,600 times brighter than the sun. It's yeah. got a <laughs> Canopus was 25. Yes, I mean, uh, the other one was 25, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. And it's got a, a diameter of 65 times that of the our sun. So this is a this is a real giant star. Okay? So basically, 65 solar systems squashed in there. That's right. Yeah. So that's that's mm. mi that's mighty Canopus. So we'll just bear in mind these things when you look at these things in the sky. So it's going to be shorter lived. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And it's of such a mass that when this one goes, it will turn supernova. Yeah. Mm. It would be a very violent end when this starts. How far goes. away is it? Um, what did we say? Uh, three hundred and I think three hundred. That's like, pretty yeah. close for such a big boom. Yeah. Mm. Yes, it is. Yep. Mm. Okay, so there's Canopus there, and also looking south, we've got this the third brightest star in the sky. It's Alpha Centauri. This is kind of the opposite. <laughs> Yeah, well, this is the thing is, when you're looking at stars out there, you, you don't know whether a star is bright because it's intrinsically bright or it's bright because it's closer to us. In the case of Alpha Centauri, it's because it's closer to us. It's the nearest star system uh, beyond the solar system. That's Alpha Centauri. And it's one of the two pointer stars that follow the Southern Cross around the sky. A little bit of a clue is in the colour, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's got a sort of yellowy white colour, yeah. Mm. But then Canopus is as well. <laughs> it's gradually turning into a red giant, yeah. Yeah. But the fascinating thing is that when we do look at um, Alpha Centauri, we discover there's two suns there, both very similar to our sun. But So if you lived on the Alpha Centauri system, you wouldn't have one sun, you'd have two. And they orbit around each other in a period of 79 years. And the distance between those two stars varies. The orbits are elliptical between like the... the distance between the Sun and Jupiter and the Sun and Neptune is distance yeah mm. but Would it ever get dark on a world oh yeah because sometimes you'd have two suns in the sky would there be times when you didn't have any suns uh, it'd be a little bit difficult yeah yeah you'd <laughs> always have some light yeah, wouldn't no, you? yes there would be because if you had them both in the daytime sky at night you'd turn away from them that's so, right yeah. so you could have dark yeah yeah. yeah, but your, your climate with the two suns would be quite interesting, I would think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Warm to hot. That's right, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, Alpha Centauri A, the brighter of the two, is 50% uh, brighter than the sun. Its, it's mass is 1.1. .1. Alpha Centauri B, the smaller of the two stars, is half the luminosity of the other sun. But both of them are so similar to our sun, and both of them have planets both of them will be capable of supporting life out there, okay? And in, indeed, we do notice planets around these stars. Well, they might all be barren worlds like the moon, like we've shown here, but there's always that possibility that life may exist out there as well. And of course, this is the fascinating thing at the moment. We're just getting to the point where we begin to discover such things. Yeah, they'd have planets that were... A bit closer to their suns, wouldn't they? Yeah. Because some of the outer ones would get further. biffed off, yeah, yeah, get thrown out, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's right, yeah. Mm. Well, but the thing is that Alpha Centauri is not a, a double star, it's a triple star. And there is another star which is very, very faint, can't even be seen with the NADI. It's the nearest star beyond the solar system, that is Proxima Centauri. Right. And here, for those of you who look at, you'll see an artist's impression of one of the worlds, which we know are orbiting around Proxima. Uh, and you can see the other two bright stars in the distance there. It's quite a distance off from the other two, yeah, though, isn't that's it? that's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, Proxima, the nearest star, it's 4.24 light years away. And its brightness is 1 18 thousandth, that 18 thousandth, that of the sun. Look at all those flares. Yeah. Well, it is. It's, it undergoes enormous eruptions. But it's very, very faint. But it's one of the most common type of stars in the galaxy. Mm. Right? So it's, a, it's a, not much bigger than a planet, about the size of Jupiter or something like that. More massive than Jupiter. It generates its own it's energy. It's just a lot denser. And suffers from flares and eruptions. Yeah. And we know there's planets around it. But, it, hey... We know one of them, they call it another Earth because it's about the same distance. It, if it was a stable star, it would have about the same amount of energy coming to it as the Earth does. And it's an Earth-sized planet. But of course, but with the eruptions from Proxima... You get blasted, it, it's wouldn't atmosphere you? is probably blasted into space. I yeah. mean, the, the yeah. northern lights on that planet would be quite amazing. And if you were standing on, on the surface of that planet 
and look at see we can see a big flare in the picture on here you can see the two bright stars alpha the two alpha stars a and b there and also you see our sun in the sky and there it is there that's what our sun would look like from there um it's and part it was, of cassiopeia isn't it's it? it's part of the constellation of cassiopeia the w yeah. w is just to the right uh, that's right yeah mm. anyway i've got to shut up now because we are finish off just a briefly mention if you want to follow up more of these things in the night sky uh, we do regular star treks you have to phone up Kay and book in and we can take you around the heavens and pick all these stars out you okay. can email me though the email yeah. is on yeah. the uh, web page as well so um, at the moment we're open wednesday to sunday from 10 a.m to 4 p.m but you can also book guided tours or star evenings at any time but you have to book those all right yeah and one final reminder don't forget the star of bethlehem on december the 22nd phone up k and book a fascinating story catch you in a couple of weeks folks bye definitely